fake dichotomy between the digital and, and the real or, or whatever, there is definitely this, this, this theme of, of space as a critical component of libraries and archives and, and of being able to connect with communities. How do you guys, do you, do you see a, a, a link between that or do you have a particular view on, on the importance of space in, in the kind of work that you do? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, the, uh, there's another component to public libraries which is a place for people to just be. You don't actually have to do anything except walk through the doors and not be visibly breaking the law and then you can stay uh, all day till we close. And you can read there or not, you can uh, use free Wi-Fi or not. It's one of the last places to just be in a free but public space, either on your own or meeting people. So uh, the physical environment is hugely important. I had mentioned the community meeting rooms. That came up so much in the planning of the new Nutsum Upstrap Homer Library that people wanted a place that they could use the meeting rooms because if you're on you know, a group, low income, anybody, to get a place to meet and do stuff was very, very important. So yes, I agree, physical space. Um, even people who are all digital, they want a physical space to do their digital things and meet other people. Oh, uh, yeah, I think this, the, the aspect of space is really important to, to this, both this project and the work that I want to do at the library, the artist work center that we're working on. Um, so for one, it's, yeah, it's great to have a place to like, just be without having to pay for a coffee. Um, and I think it, it's a, one thing that, that specifically the women's bookstore I'm trying to think through um, that's still very difficult is the idea of having places like the women's bookstore was it was interesting. It's, its physical layout was like the front was the bookstore, and then the back was a social area. But the social area was for women only, right? And there's this dichotomy between spaces that are very necessary and connected. Um, and so that's something that I'm trying to think through with the artist run center, right? Uh, and its relationship to let's say more public libraries. It's uh, the, the 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 difference and the, uh, how these things can negotiate their difference and cooperate is the idea of having our spaces, you know, like whether it's a woman's space or just a sort of more private space, uh, and you know, ideas of a, like a larger public, um, and and how maybe this, you know, the difference between let's say autonomous space and like general revolution or something like that. Um, but it's, it's something really important to, to how we think about space, the library, and, and I think the other thing was, um, at least with what we're trying to do there, is uh, the importance in organizing of just having bodies in a space together, right? Um, and maybe this is just off, to off topic a bit, but it's important for the work of the bookstore was that, you know, um, the way that we sort of connect digitally, especially in terms of like you know, organizing protests, is like important. It's nice to have Twitter uh, and nice to be able to message people and tell them about where the cops are. But um, it's always it's it's always so good to just have people in a space together, right? Uh, and then see what kind of like encounters can can occur from there because you, you don't know what's going to happen when there's like a, you know, a person from this public and another person from this public and they're just like crunched together in one room. Um, yeah, for me, I think both are really important to the work that we're doing. Um, yeah, being able to have a space, being able to meet face to face is really important for building relationships. Um, but, but also in the terms of the work that the union does, making resources available is really important because we're serving the whole province. Um, we do our best whenever we have money to get stuff digitized and scanned and put online, so we have resources that especially folks who have resources related to land claims, so communities that aren't in the lower mainland can come and make, or can go online rather and make use of them. Um, now also just personally thinking in terms of the digital realm, um, that's where sort of a lot of my learning and inspiration comes from, um, just seeing what other librarians and archivists across the country and in the United States are doing in the projects they're working on um, because there's really cool things happening and there's also um, inspiration there that they draw from people doing stuff locally and more widely. So being able to access both sort of 
physical space and human beings and also in the digital realm are important. And I guess just speaking to the theme, radical librarianship, and beyond just sort of um, the, the kind of the, the term participation in this sort of bland, everyone gets along, happy-go-lucky, uh, collectivism kind of participation. For, for the people who are here, who, who are interested in, 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 in this topic, how do you see this, this idea of, of radical librarianship, and where, where, do, where does someone who isn't an archivist or a librarian, where do they fit in that kind of, of practice? Actually, Melissa, I have a question for you yeah. related to that. Was okay. that um, I think the difference, like, so it's interesting sort of trying to mediate uh, between, let's say, <laughs> radical librarianship and media democracy, because sometimes radicalism and democracy do not mix, right? Um, that's another conversation, though. <laughs> and, uh, but, but I think what, what was really, I really wanted to know about um, from your presentation was that idea that some research can be harmful for indigenous uh, communities. And I, I think there was a, a conference earlier this year about like refusal as a research. Um, a sort of technique, uh, specifically around like sort of exposing indigenous knowledges and histories to let's say extractive industries. Um, but I think that that really speaks to maybe the difference between uh, media, like democracy and radicalism, because like someone who's like some sort of liberal that would be like, oh yeah, it's undemocratic to censor some of the information. It's just like that's you know I think yeah, can you speak more to. Okay, uh, yeah, just in terms of that, that's actually. Um, I'm not sure if anybody heard me do a presentation before, but I had some trouble in library school. <laughs> um, and then that there were things that we were getting taught that were sort of driving up my understanding of things. And one of that was the concept of sort of open access. And you're always getting exposed to the idea that you're getting told that, you know, all you know, all information should be available that we within communities, we have our own laws and protocols regarding what can, you know, what can be, should be protected, what should be available and stuff. So yeah, I had some challenges there. And um, just in terms of the concept of radical librarianship, um, my, the executive director of our organization asked me yesterday, what are we talking about? And, uh, and what radical things I'd be saying, but <laughs> I don't feel that I am being particularly radical because respect for cultures and respect for people and relevance, um, they shouldn't be radical ideas. <laughs> be respectful, be relevant, be engaged with people. Um, and in terms of what people who don't have the library archives background, I think one of the first things to do is actually sort of step back and learn about some of the issues that we're facing. There are people out there writing back and stuff, and again, they can make resources available and just to, yeah, give me, so one, to learn yourself, and two, um, I guess ask <coughs> different organizations what they need and what stage they're at, and also give them space to figure out, in community space to figure out what they need. First, and so there's a question. I'm just wondering if anyone on the panel has ever tried to get into the reading room of National British National Library. No. <laughs> in, in terms of you know access, um, it's a highly police space. Yeah. Yeah, that's. It's, it's a credential space. Mm -hmm. um, there is a library. At the, and at the very heart of the liberal imagination. Yeah. Um, there are archivists and librarians out there who talk about that. Yeah. J.M. Drake, I forget, his, that's his Twitter handle, um, writes a lot about comparing archive space to prisons and just, um, yeah, in terms of the control over space and control over access and the monitoring that goes on. So he's an interesting person to read some of his stuff or watch his presentations. Um, yeah, because that's... I, I may, I'm going to check on Twitter who I'm I believe it's J.M. Drake, it's at J.M. Drake is his Twitter handle. While she's looking, I can add to that where, um, to build on something Melissa said about sharing versus not sharing was uh, as a public library, that had been our tradition was like, we're all about sharing, right? And equal access and so on. 
and it was uh, only after working closely with our very first First Nations storyteller in residence, that was um, Amanda Nagini from Squamish and Muska. You probably <laughs> don't. <laughs> in any case, um, uh, part of her residency with the library was um, she produced a DVD from some of the work, and that was part of what she wanted to do for a project. And then we had assumed we could circulate that DVD in our collection and make multiple copies and away we go. And, and she said, oh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> and and we, we didn't understand that it was culturally protected to some degree and we had to rethink what our expectations were, but we totally learned from that. And uh, I don't know if we would have learned without the relationship. And you had mentioned face-to-face -face relationship as well working closely with her over a period of months and months, we had enough trust to negotiate what can we do, what do we need to learn, how do we need to change, and that was important. And I think, everyone? Yeah, I have before. <laughs> okay, yeah, his name's Jarrett Drake, and his Twitter handle is at JMD, and then Drake, D-R-A-K-E. But yeah, there's lots of people doing stuff, but there's, yeah, there's a ton. <laughs> sure. the, the other, the original question you asked was about, so what does radical librarianship mean? And uh, I did the same as Melissa. It was like, well, you know, what are you, what are you really going to talk about? What do you mean radical librarianship? And I talked with a number of colleagues about you know, the things we do and what uh, we concluded that the most radical thing we can do is listen to people, just take the time to really listen and that's how we learn what we need to change or adapt or grow or it's part of a lifelong learning process whether you're talking about yourself as a person or an organization and an institution it's uh, it it seems like you're you don't have time because you don't have a deliverable at the end of it like you know what well, what are you doing oh i listened it doesn't always fit an agenda, but it's one of the most important things we can do. And we thought, well, that's pretty radical because it doesn't, it isn't something you can hand in after as a monthly report. Okay. I'm going to interrupt at this point just because I want to make sure that we have enough time for, for questions from the from the audience. Um, was there any were, were there any questions at this this stage? Did anybody want to, to jump in? Yes, over there. Yeah, hi. Um, question for Melissa. I, I was curious whether uh, there is such a tradition in the Aboriginal culture here on the West Coast as far as libraries. So, uh, some sort of historical precedent that maybe you're, you're boring on as well, or is this more uh, modern? Okay, so I am not from the Vancouver area, Muska, which is northern northwest coast of BC. Um, and in terms of sort of, A, I can't speak on behalf of all indigenous people, but um, in terms of knowledge keeping, we would um, have a lot more oral culture, but we do still, like archives, or for example, want the information that we're passing on to be you know, reliable and verified and um, so we do have, for example, protocols around who says what, when, and wit the idea of witnessing, which, um, maybe I'll just sort of do a general example. So one of the things that, a way that information is passed on and verified was through the potlatch or feast system, where you would have a gathering at events like weddings or funerals or stuff. And, um, and other occasions, but what would happen is that chiefs would get up and tell the stories and songs, and people who were there would receive gifts, which would be payment for witnessing these stories. And if anybody was in disagreement, they could, you know, walk out or not, not accept this. Um, so we have. That's a super simplification, but we have protocols for collecting information, passing on information. Um, we want sort of this continuation of information and knowledge over time, like we would physically have in books or archives. So 
I think sometimes people sort of put a dichotomy between archives and oral histories, and I don't think that should necessarily be the case because we want the same recorded, reliable, reliable um, sorry, um, information there. And then we also have other reminders of it, like our crests, and, for example, which would relate to stories and, and songs and things. So, yeah, we do we do record information, just not necessarily in the same way. <laughs> yes, over there in the back. Um, I was listening one time to an interview with Michael Moore, and he was talking about when he released Fahrenheit 9/11 as a book. Um, Basically, the Bush administration had uh, orders a cease and desist, and all these books were being uh, packaged up to be burned. And he got a call from a woman who said, oh, I'm with the American Librarian Association. We have a radio show, and could we interview you? So on this radio show, he explained that they were literally going to burn this version of his book. And apparently what happened was like lightning hit the U.S. administration. And in this interview, Moore said, one group you never want to mess with is the librarians. <laughs> so to me, you guys in a sense are like modern stewards of, of our history. And here we are in this milieu where every day our reality is completely different, right? The technology is emerging at such a speed. Yet Nicholas Carr uh, writes this book, The Shallows, showing how there's so much distraction in our electronic communication that it's almost designed to make us stupider. Right? Every time you concentrate, somebody changes your, 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 your topic. So as I understand it, the US Congress has now put about 800 million books online under Wikipedia. I mean, do you envision a day where libraries don't have any books anymore? No. <laughs> Not in the slightest. Uh, I think people always will want the choice of uh, the pleasure of a physical book, a book with photographs in it that you can find your way around. They, many people are visual um, in the sense that that part they want to look back on. Yeah, it was the upper left corner near the beginning of the book. You can't do that on an online book if you don't have like a search box. You can only use a search box if you remember the word you're looking for, but I know that that word was the upper left-hand corner near the beginning, right? It's, it's a very visual way to track. So, no, I don't. I think things are shifting, but the choice, people will feel very strongly about having that choice. I agree. <laughs> it's, like, it's like hard to look at screens, um, at least for me, and like Kobo's or whatever, Kindles, they, have, they do that thing where they flash when they... Like clip pages, this is bad for I think. And also, just to add, in terms of archives, if we think libraries is published material and archives as unique original material, one of the things with archival records is they're never all going to get digitized. We just don't have the resources at all. So there's tons of stuff that will never be online. Um, plus, there's also some privacy concerns and everything. So, um, yeah, we're going to need that physical access. I, I just want to say that my grandfather in 1942 wrote a book about our Lord, uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, Israel wasn't even a state, the book's completely obsolete, yet I found that it's been digitized and put online. So there's a lot of obscure stuff that is being put on record. But I just want to mention that I was at a meeting on Thursday night with uh, some of the pioneers behind the new blockchain software. And they're saying in 20 years that could replace the Microsoft Universe, HTTP. And the beauty of blockchain is it's so decentralized that you can't start rewriting history, like Facebook and certain other organizations. Apparently, they're customizing news shows for your cases. Uh, so, so. I'm not sure actually how the UBCIC is funded. Um, so, yeah, I'd be interested to hear about that. Or other resources, maybe, beyond that. Yeah, Okay. Um, in terms of the union's funding for the library and archives itself, we actually, in, term, in our structure, the library and archives falls under our research department, which is there to do research on and things, um, specific things. Um, so our money comes from the federal government, which has been 
an issue. <laughs> Number one, we have to reapply for it every year. And two, with our previous government, I think in 2014, we had our funding cut by 38%. So um, that has definitely affected the work we do in our staffing levels. Um, so that basically pays my salary and keeps the lights on, and we hope we have get, managed to get some other research related funding at the end of or during the year. Um, for our archives work, it's a lot of it's really grant funded, so our institution is chasing after the same pots of money that other archives. I get the sense that archives are more grant maybe project related than libraries, but um, yeah, the funding is probably one of the biggest issues that we deal with. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> um, specifically because uh, essentially what we're trying to do at T21A and my new position is to convert uh, what was considered or practiced as a, as a gallery for, for 10 years and then trying to uh, reorient uh, thinking around it as more of like a community center slash library, right? Um, and when you know, it's just like essentially we, we go, we, we are funded through three levels of arts funding and it's really hard to convince funders that anything is happening when people are sitting around reading. Uh, they expect like, you know, a big sculpture or a big ugly mural or something like that. They like want the thing. And it, it's been difficult, you know, when, especially when I think, and to answer your question about radical libraries, right? And where I think the, the history of radical libraries is again through Ricky Dibbery's uh, Socialism Life Cycle paints it really nicely, um, is that, you know, they, they always had uh, these these spaces of, of radical print production were always spaces that had public actions, but also like sort of back spaces for like fugitive planning and, 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 and organizing and taking care of each other. And that's the part that's hard to get funding for, you know, the second half, like that second half of it, which I think is like the real radical part of, of what libraries can do is have be a space for, for this kind of uh, so hot, like radical autonomy. Um, so. In a sense, yes, funding is really hard to get. <laughs> and if anyone has a few dollars, you can pass it to me. <laughs> but, uh, I just yeah. had a quick thought related to the radicalness of that. Um, like I said, officially our money comes to specific claims research, but our library is really open to anybody who wants to come and do research there. So we're not just doing claims research, we're using that money to do other, allow people to do other stuff. So. Yeah, and there's always with everything you set your priorities, and you say what's the priority, even though like listening is like, oh, people are saying, mm -hmm. <laughs> where's the sculpture? <laughs> but uh, it, there always has to be something you stop doing if you want to do more of something else. And it, so it's constantly looking at, is there something we can drop if we want to spend more time on this? Is there another way? And there's always examples of that, where um, to do less of one thing we were able to open more branches on Sundays. You know, for it. But to open more branches on Sundays, we stopped doing something that we decided was slightly less important. Uh, it's always that juggling thing. And yes, we're often after the same plot you know, mm -hmm. as far as funding goes. But the PPL is, is it, it's not grant? Like no, um, it's uh, not funded by grants, although many of our special projects are. Okay, right? So, for example, the first three years of the First Nations Storyteller in Residence was funded by um, the Vancouver Foundation. After three years, we said, this is so awesome, we're paying for it through our own, right? And, uh, um, yeah, the, so sometimes little things are funded through Friends of the Library or other grant projects. The bread and butter, bones, potatoes, whatever, is, uh, <laughs> it's you. It's the taxpayers, right? So yes, it is publicly funded. Any other questions? Yes. There's different terms to indicate what you're talking about, the library, uh, in that uh, they'll concern themselves with Indian culture, Native uh, culture, uh, First Nation culture. What is your term? What term do you prefer? Because it's very confusing to me. I, I come from Europe, and uh, this uh, native environment is very interesting, but uh, I'm not clear what you would like to be uh, concerned with. Okay. Number one, I can't speak on behalf of all indigenous people, but for me personally, ideally, you would 
refer to somebody from by the nation they are a part of. So I'm the Scus, so I would call me the Scus. Um, and when I'm sort of broadly speaking about indigenous people, I do tend to use the word indigenous because it, but this is just my personal um, perspective, because I want often when I'm speaking about issues, um, indigenous people use it to refer to the first peoples of the land and often, and because there are first peoples of lands in other places as well, I use the term indigenous to broadly cover kind of issues when I'm talking about issues that are affecting us and others as well, because the issues that we've been talking about today are ones that are faced by people in Maori and Australia, or in New Zealand and Australia, Indigenous peoples, and that sort of thing. Um, if you want to get technical, the Constitution refers to um, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis, and then I think he uses the term Aboriginal to cover all three. <laughs> you can get into huge discussions about terminology, and again, I can read some blog posts about it to a friend, but he wants to. <laughs> follow up, but yeah, I like the term indigenous personally. Aboriginal is fine. Indians, we use it when we refer to when we're talking amongst ourselves, but not, but like we wouldn't want to not indigenous person to use that term, so don't use the term Indian. <laughs> um, but ideally call the, what, the nation that they're from. So we don't use the term Indian. Yeah, no, not. unless, yeah. That was Christopher Columbus that did all this, messed it up. Yeah. <laughs> Although, then the government has this whole technical status Indian they, where they've decided but to. But I saw it on the screen, it says Indian. So oh, yeah, Indians, because the, the um, Indian does status Indian. Indian an that, yeah, it also it relates to when they're founding, also, it still has a kind of technical term within, yeah, it's, <laughs> this is a complicated subject, but, <laughs> um, we so. We need an archivist to, uh, to dig into it and, and understand <laughs> oh, the, there's, the history. There's people out there written about it, um, it's not a short so, answer, but, um, yeah, in terms of Indian, we, because the government still has, makes decisions over who is status Indian, Indian, Indian yeah, because they still, we do identify Indian, status Indians and versus Indian non-status Indian, Indian Act, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, there's still that sort of overarching clarify. You're not Indian, mm -hmm. you're uh, indigenous. indigenous. I like indigenous, yeah, but other people might have different answers. <laughs> so I, I, I want to make sure that we have enough time to thank our panelists before we, we clear things out and, and set up for the for the keynote. So everyone, let's thank our, our three panelists. It was a really informative and, and really interesting. Thank you.